Okay, so this is uh, the second um, YouTube revision session uh, for Hitler's foreign policy and the causes of World War II. Um, it won't surprise you to learn this is the section that's dealing with the causes of World War II. I'm going to start with appeasement. Uh, so I'm going to DEA appeasement. Uh, within that, I'm going to DEA the Sudetenland crisis uh, and DEA the Munich uh, agreement. Uh, and then I'm going to look at the collapse of Czechoslovakia. I'll DEA that, the actions of Hitler, um, how his actions reflected his aims and the impact of the collapse of Czechoslovakia. And then... The final thing I'll look at is the Nazi-Soviet pact and the attack on Poland. Uh, we'll describe why, uh, what was agreed uh, between the two powers, why they agreed this explanation, and then we'll analyse the effects. Uh, did it make war inevitable? And so on. Okay. So first of all, then, the uh, uh, policy of appeasement. What was appeasement? Uh, appeasement is a name often given to British foreign policy in the years 1919 to 39. Um, Chamberlain is often the poster boy of uh, appeasement. He believed that Britain should take an active role in solving Hitler's grievances. He felt that Germany had good reason to be upset at many of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. So his aim really was to find out exactly what Hitler wanted and show him that reasonable claims could be met by, by negotiation instead of force. Uh, so that in this way, he, he hoped that the problems of Versailles, problems caused by Versailles, could be solved. It was a risky strategy. Uh, Chamberlain was aware of the risks, but he felt that it was the right thing to do. Um, it meant trusting Hitler and believing what he said. Of course, now with hindsight, we know that perhaps that was foolish, but at the time, it can be uh, seen that it was not uh, all that crazy in the context of the time. Um, France were willing, uh, well, not willing to begin with to support the idea of appeasement, but they were they fell in line uh, after 1937 because they felt more secure on their borders anyway, because they were building the Maginot Line, uh, which they believed would prevent any future invasion from Germany. So, led by Britain and grudgingly accepted by France because they felt more secure because of the Maginot Line. Okay. Why did Britain follow this policy? Wanted to avoid another war at all costs. And they genuinely believed that uh, Germany had a grievance uh, because of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, it was also feared that uh, any World War II would be horrific. It would dwarf World War I. This was known because of uh, recent fighting in the Spanish Civil War uh, where Carpet bombing tactics had uh, seen 2,500 people killed in just three hours. In the context of the time, that did seem shocking and horrific. If you compare it to the number of losses in Zeppelin raids in World War I, uh, the number of people being killed in just three hours of German bombing was frightening. And that did put people off uh, wanting to confront Germany. It did um, lend weight to the idea of appeasement. Economically, Britain was still suffering from the Great Depression of 1929, so they were reluctant to start a war. Appeasement seemed to be the easiest course, the cheapest course. Uh, the collapse of the League of Nations also meant that something else had to be tried. The League of Nations hadn't worked. A united front hadn't worked, so appeasement seemed to be a sensible alternative. And lastly, the one thing is almost uh, is usually forgotten, Britain feared communism far more than they feared Nazism. So they were more willing to um, give a little to Hitler in the hope that they could use him as a buffer between them and the USSR. Arguments against using appeasement, uh, because Hitler could not be trusted, had already broken promises since 1933. Uh, appeasement made Britain look weak and gave Hitler further confidence to uh, take uh, greater chunks of Europe. It could be seen as betraying the lands that had been protected by the Treaty of Versailles. 
and it allowed Hitler to increase his strength and power. Judge it in the context of the time, though. Uh, so, appeasement in action, the Sudetenland crisis. What was the Sudetenland crisis? Czechoslovakia, one of the strongest of the new states created by the treaties of 1919, had strong, well-fortified frontiers, especially in the West. Um, okay, what was the problem? Hitler was the problem. Hitler encouraged Henlein, Henlein, the leader of the Nazis in the Sudetenland, to campaign for independence. Okay, so again, it's Hitler kind of fermenting trouble uh, amongst uh, ethnic Germans uh, within uh, Czechoslovakia in Sudetenland for uh, getting them to lobby for independence. Hitler promised Henlein that he could depend on German support and Chamberlain was determined to use appeasement to prevent war breaking out. What action did Hitler take? Hitler encouraged Henlein uh, to, in to uh, campaign for independence and stir up riots. Similarly, uh, similar to the tactics used in uh, the Anschluss with Austria. Why did Hitler want the Sudetenland? Explain now, okay, deepening the, the argument. Explain why the Sudetenland was uh, important to Hitler. Hitler wanted the Sudetenland because he wanted to unite the three million German-speaking people uh, within Germany. Uh, it was one of his main aims. He wanted to expand the greater Germany uh, and create Lebensraum, Lebensraum um, and uniting all German speakers. It would create more industrial workers and increase the German economy. By removing Czechoslovakia as an independent state, crucially, it removed the Sudetenland's fortified borders. Okay, It opened up the east, making the Sudetenland part of Germany, and it was like opening a door to the rest of Eastern Europe. He could also use the Skoda factory uh, in that area in the Sudetenland to build armaments, to build artillery particularly. Okay, so that's why Hitler wanted the Sudetenland. So, further explanation. How and why did Chamberlain appease Hitler in the Sudetenland? Chamberlain wanted to avoid war. Uh, over German speakers returning to Germany. He thought this was perfectly sensible. He thought that the Treaty of Versailles was unfair in this. He's actually quoted as saying he didn't want to involve Britain in a faraway country uh, in an issue, a conflict between people of whom we know nothing. He thought, misguidedly, he also thought he, he understood Hitler and could reason with him. Thought he was a man he could do business with. And of course, as we've explained, he wanted to avoid war at all costs. British public were not in favour of war, the economy wasn't ready for it, and we'd already seen how damaging war could be in this modern age. So, analysis. How big a threat was the Sudetenland crisis to European peace? The Sudeten crisis was a large threat as Chamberlain returned to England and started to prepare for war. As Hitler kind of marched into the Sudet, or expressed his interest in taking the Sudetenland, Britain looked as though it was getting ready for war. However, as soon as Hitler sent out a note requesting a conference in Munich, Chamberlain accepted, showing that Chamberlain was sending out false threats. He never really wanted war. It was, it was sabre-rattling, is the phrase. Okay? Uh, he was trying to control Hitler and force him to the conference table, and that's exactly what he did. Okay? So, preparing for war, following the, the, the onset of the Sudeten crisis, um, led to the Munich conference. Hitler quickly responded, uh, showing that actually the crisis was only a limited threat because Hitler wasn't ready for war at that time. Hitler still wanted to build up the army uh, ready for his invasion. He wanted that breathing space. In 1938, he wasn't ready. And he leapt, up, leapt at the opportunity to stall countries. He leapt at the opportunity presented by appeasement. And he agreed to meet uh, European leaders around the conference table in Munich.
it could argue, could be argued, therefore, that Europe was not close to war uh, during the Sudeten crisis. The Munich Agreement then, okay, moving on, September 1938, things ratchet up a gear. As a result, a direct result of the Sudetenland crisis, the Munich Conference uh, is called. September 1938. What was agreed at the Munich Conference? Okay, so we're describing, we're DEA and we're describing the Munich Conference. Four powers were represented at the Munich Conference. Chamberlain for Great Britain, Hitler for Germany, Mussolini for Italy, and Daladier for France. Daladier. D A L A D I E I E R. D A L A D I E R. Daladier. Uh, crucially, and again, just displaying the same kind of arrogance that was shown at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, no representatives from Czechoslovakia were present. their country, and they weren't really involved in the whole discussion. Uh, crucially also, the USSR were not invited. This offended Stalin, made him less likely to cooperate with Western powers. Stalin believed that, quite rightly, believed that uh, Western powers, Great Britain, France, etc., were trying to appease Hitler in the hope that they would direct him towards Russia to get him to deal with Stalin, okay? And of course, understandably, this really upset Stalin. At Munich, on the 30th of September 1938, it was agreed that the Sudetenland would become German. Great Britain basically surrendered Sudetenland to Germany. Britain and France guaranteed the remaining part of Czechoslovakia. They guaranteed it. They offered to protect the remaining part of Czechoslovakia. Sudetenland a big part, but only part of Czechoslovakia. So Hitler didn't take over all of Czechoslovakia at this point, only the Sudetenland. And Britain and France promised to protect the rest of Czechoslovakia. The Czechs were forced, how, offended, how offensive is that? The Czechs were forced to accept the Munich Agreement. Chamberlain then met Hitler privately and Hitler agreed to a declaration that Britain and Germany would never go to war again. And that discussion, not war, would solve future disagreements between them. This was the famous piece of paper that Chamberlain held in his hand when he returned to Britain on the 1st of October 1938. He claimed it was peace with honour. Um, it was a lie. Hitler had lied to him and Chamberlain had believed him. So again, expanding, explaining what happened at the, uh, at the Munich conference. Why did Chamberlain appease Hitler? At the Munich Conference, Britain and France essentially agreed to the demands that Hitler made to immediately transfer the Sudetenland to his more aggressive, um, to, uh, so, sorry, to, to appease his aggressive stance, his wanting to unite all German-speaking um, people. However, there was a second uh, meeting uh, at Godesburg on the 22nd of September. Chamberlain appeased Hitler despite preparing for war uh, at the same time. Britain and Germany were very close to war during this point, and as Britain was still economically suffering from the Wall Street crash in 1929, it needed time to build up weapons and arms in order to go to war. Appeasing Hitler would give Britain the chance to do this. Okay, so it, it, it's more complex than it, than, than it might seem uh, at first. Yes, Chamberlain looks like a bit of a fool when he's waving his piece of paper around in hindsight. He says it was peace with honour. Um, he said it was peace with honour. It wasn't. But... He did successfully gain time for Britain to build up its munitions, rebuild its army. Britain was still suffering from the Great Depression. And of course, he had to um, consider public opinion. He was an, ele an elected politician. People remembered the horrors of World War I and they didn't want to return to it. Nobody in Great Britain was banging the drum. Well, very few people in Great Britain were banging the drum for war at this point. They might not have liked Hitler, but they didn't, want, didn't at this time want to go to war with him over German-speaking territory. And as we've said before, people were horrified at the thought of war. Whole, all of Europe was coming out of the Great Depression. Um, the collapse of the League of Nations meant that this was um, 
a viable alternative. Okay. So, analysing the Munich Agreement, what was the significance of the Munich Agreement? Hitler gained the Sudetenland without a fight. Czechoslovakia had been betrayed. Um, peace had been maintained and time had been bought for Britain to build up its armed forces. But at what cost? Czechoslovakia had lost its defensive frontier and become vulnerable to invasion. As I said, the Sudet giving the Sudetenland to Hitler would uh, open up the doors to Eastern Europe for him. Perhaps signif most significantly of all, the USSR had been left out and felt betrayed. And this kind of paved the way for the Nazi-Soviet pact, which we'll look at briefly, uh, shortly rather. Okay. Um, in Britain, uh, further significance, Duff Cooper um, resigned from the cabinet as First Lord of the Admiralty, in protest at the Munich Agreement. So there were people in Britain making a noise about how dangerous appeasement was. Uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, Duff Cooper, D-U-F-F, uh, Cooper, C-O-O-P-E-R, resigned as First Lord of the Admiralty. So it wasn't all uh, British people, British politicians were in agreement over what's, what should be done. <clears throat> so overall assessment, overall analysis, how important was the Munich Agreement in leading to war? The Munich Agreement was very important to the outbreak of war. Uh, it helped to guarantee peace at the time. It ultimately led to the occupation of Czechoslovakia, as we'll see shortly. Hitler uh, gave it six months in Sudetenland and then took over the rest of Czechoslovakia, uh, proving that he couldn't be trusted once more, and then eventually Poland. And these, of course, were the key triggers for war, as we know. The Munich Agreement signed away the defensive frontiers of Czechoslovakia, opening the door for, to Eastern Europe for Hitler. And by not inviting the USSR to the conference, this annoyed Stalin led, to the, uh, led him to make this uh, non-aggression pact, or encouraged him at least to make this non-aggression pact, uh, which eventually led to uh, German or encouraged German invasion. Although they did not fight for Czechoslovakia, Britain and France were now willing to fight for Polish independence, which they intended to honour. It was a step too far. It led basically to a kind of last straw uh, mentality in Britain. Okay. So the next section, the collapse of Czechoslovakia. This one won't take quite as long. DEA, the collapse of Czechoslovakia. What actions did Hitler take, first of all, to occupy Czechoslovakia? Describing the actions of, of taking over Czechoslovakia. Um, first of all, Hitler encouraged Slovaks uh, to protest. They were forced to hand Czechoslovakia over. And he simply marched in, claiming the German army was restoring order. So stirring up trouble. This is a similar tactics used in his own election campaigns in 1930s. Uh, whipped up discontent and then marched in and restored order. Why did he do this? Again, it's simple. It was part of his aim to unite German-speaking peoples, create Lebensraum in the east, and uh, provide mar uh, gain areas where raw materials were available. Um, the resources of the Czech army, which was well-equipped, had 34 divisions. That all became part of the German uh, what was becoming an empire. Further explanation, why was he able to do it? Although strong, the Czech army could not resist the German army. They had no choice but to give Czechoslovakia to Hitler without a fight. Don't forget also that Czechoslovakia had lost its defensive frontier at the Munich uh, conference. Over 70% of its heavy industry, including the Skoda works, were all in the Sudetenland, which now belonged to Germany anyway. So they had, there was very little they could do to stop Hitler taking over anyway. 
Why did Britain and France not prevent the annexation of Czechoslovakia? Britain could not prevent Germany taking over Czechoslovakia. They had a relatively small army and it was geographically impossible for Britain to prevent the German forces entering Czechoslovakia. They couldn't get there in time, put simply. France would not act without Britain, even though it was closer and had a larger army. They were on the wrong side of Germany. They would have to pass through Germany to get to Czechoslovakia to help the Czechs. So the only action that Britain and France could realistically take at that time, immediately after the, you know, it, as it happened, was to protest. However, they could have declared war, or threatened to declare war on Germany, and they could have built up an, an alliance with the USSR, neither of which they did. Again, this encouraged Hitler to do more. The USSR, not a big threat at the moment, because Stalin's angry with the West because of the way he's been treated at the Munich conference. And they're still not willing to even threaten to declare war yet. Even though Britain and France did not declare war in March, the German actions in Czechoslovakia set into motion a chain of events which would eventually result in the outbreak of war in September. So we need to um, make the case that the annexation, the taking over of Czechoslovakia by the German army was a real significant step on the road to war. It set in motion this chain of events. How did it do this? Right. Okay, we're on to the analysis, the significance, the impact, the consequences of the annexation of Czechoslovakia. The annexation of Czechoslovakia showed Chamberlain that Hitler would not be trusted. He'd broken his promises of the Munich Agreement. He also broken promises to consult Chamberlain before taking any action that may lead to war. This led to conscription being introduced in Britain during the peace time, during peacetime in order to build up an army that could defeat Germany. So Great Britain begins to prepare for war. It's ready in September 1939. It led, to Chamberlain, it led Chamberlain to realise that a solution could not be bought through appeasement. He decided to take action the next time Hitler uh, acted belligerently. So when Hitler demanded the return of Danzig in Poland, it was at this point that Chamberlain and France offered to guarantee Polish borders. Okay. So the taking of the Sudetenland was kind of the last straw for Chamberlain. He started to build up the army and he promised that he would not allow Hitler to take, to retake Danzig, which remember had been taken away from Germany in the Treaty of Versailles. This ultimately led to war because Britain and France had guaranteed to help if Hitler invaded Poland and they would then have to go to war. Finally, the occupation of Czechoslovakia also showed Chamberlain that appeasement would not work against Hitler. Czechoslovakia did not have any German speakers and was not against the treaty. This led to war as Chamberlain now understood that Hitler would not respond to peaceful action. So conscription was introduced and the army was built up. Right, DEA, the last section now and we should come in under half an hour. The last section is the Soviet, so the Nazi-Soviet um, non-aggression pact. So, describing what was the pact, what was agreed in the Nazi-Soviet pact. Germany and the USSR signed the pact on the 23rd of August 1939. In this pact, this agreement, Germany and the USSR agreed not to interfere against the other power in the event of a war. Secret clauses in the pact divided Poland between Germany and the USSR. They basically agreed to carve up Poland between them. Okay? The USSR received the land it had lost at the end of World War I, and Germany received the west of Poland, including Danzig and the Polish Corridor, territory that it had lost at the end of World War I. It wasn't an alliance, be very clear on that. It did not say, say that Germany and Russia were going to help each other in a war, but that they would not fear, interfere against the other power in the event of a war. It was what we call a non-aggression pact. They wouldn't fight each other at this time anyway. So explanation, why did the Nazi-Soviet pact shock the world? Well, firstly, because 
Nazism, fascism and communism were complete enemies. They were ideological opposites. They hate, the Nazis hated communists, communists hated Nazis. So for them to, to have this marriage of convenience was very shocking to people at the time. <clears throat> Particularly as Hitler's desire for Lebensraum was directed towards the USSR. It was not in Stalin's interest, in Russia's interest, to help Germany in any way. Ultimately, the USSR was gunning for German territory. Hitler had never hidden his opposition and hatred for communism. He, uh, he said this in his, in his book, Mein Kampf, in 1924. So the, and the Nazi-Soviet pact went against um, Russian uh, Soviet uh, agreements, the anti term pact that Hitler um, had signed with Italy and Japan in 1937 was also opposed to communism. So it went against all of these ideas, uh, ideas in USSR, ideas in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, the two were just mutually exclusive. So it shocked the world that they were willing to work together to pick on poor little Poland. Why did they sign it then? Why, were, why did Hitler and uh, Stalin sign the Nazi-Soviet pact? Hitler did not want to fight a war on two fronts. If he had a non-aggression pact with the USSR, he could focus his attention on uh, France eventually in the West. He was also hoping to regain lands uh, lost to Poland uh, following the Treaty of Versailles, the Polish Corridor in Danzig. In Danzig, 90% of the people there were German, and so uh, this was part of his aim to unite all German-speaking people. Hitler was also avoiding... Uh, I've said that already. He was avoiding a war on two fronts. Um, why did Stalin sign the Nazi-Soviet Pact? Well, Stalin would be regaining the lands Russia had lost at the end of World War I. He would regain East Poland, which had previously been under Russia's control before World War I. And he would be expanding communism towards the West, which was a stated goal of Marxism, to spread communism around the world. Analysis. How significant was the uh, uh, Nazi-Soviet pact? Did it make war inevitable? War was made inevitable by the Nazi-Soviet pact because it decided the fate of Poland in the short term. Hitler believed that Britain would not act in Poland just because... They hadn't acted before in Czechoslovakia, despite their guarantee. Hitler basically thought that Chamberlain was full of hot air. He thought that he could get away with anything because of appeasement. But change, Chamberlain's view on appeasement had changed. He now believed Hitler could not be trusted. Because the USSR had to be left out of the Munich Agreement, they had turned Germany to their aims. Realistically, only the USSR could defend Poland geographically. Britain was too far away to actually help uh, in any great way. But now Russia, instead of helping, was going to split Poland up between uh, itself and Germany. The pact was signed on the 23rd, 23rd of August and war broke out on the 3rd of September. So you can see how close together these things were. The Nazi-Soviet pact declared, uh, signed on the 23rd of October, uh, start again, the 23rd of August and War actually broke out on the 3rd of September. Britain finally stirred into, uh, into action. Britain would honour its guarantee of, the Polish, uh, of Polish independence and on April, uh, in April, made in April 1939, and Hitler did not believe Britain would act as they didn't act over Czechoslovakia. Appeasement was finished. Poland's fate was sealed. Okay, and that's it. Just final thing is, uh, as we're going through these, judge at all points. Did the the significance of the different effect, uh, different events? Did they make war inevitable? Okay, just take stock, make that judgment throughout each one. Okay, I'll get that loaded up to uh, YouTube as well, so it's there for revision.